Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Orrell. I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. And I want to uh, extend a very warm welcome to all of you uh, for joining our event today, New Approaches for Grassroots Entrepreneurship. For those of you who um, are joining an AEI event for the first time or are not familiar with our work, the American Enterprise Institute is a public policy think tank dedicated to defending human dignity expanding human potential and building a freer and safer world. The work of our scholars and staff advances ideas rooted in our belief in democracy, free enterprise, American strength and global leadership, solidarity with those at the periphery of our society and a pluralistic entrepreneurial culture. And that's really what we're here to talk about uh, today is that last bit about a pluralistic uh, entrepreneurial culture that uh, seeks to embrace those at the periphery of American society. So go ahead and advance uh, the next slide. Our agenda today is um, that we will have uh, some opening comments by me in a few minutes uh, that kind of help frame uh, this discussion. Then our lead speaker and the author of the paper that we're talking about today, uh, Mauricio Miller, will walk us through um, the, the structure of the uh, project that he's been working on in uh, West Africa. And then we're gonna have responses from our two panelists, Cornelia Hulstrunk and John Denner, both of Princeton University. Then we'll have a little bit of panel discussion and hopefully we'll have some time left over for Q&A from the audience. With regard to Q&A, um, we can put up a, our banner here that will um, show you where and how to um, submit questions. Uh, and um, that's our, that's our, um, I'm not sure that that's our banner. Uh, our banner is something else, <laughs> which is AEI on entrepreneurship, I think. And the, um, the, uh, the email address is jake.easter at AEI.org um, and he's my research assistant and uh, is help, there we go. Uh, Jake Easter at AEI.org or on Twitter at hashtag AEI on entrepreneurship. Um, so that's, the, that's where we're headed. And so I'll get us started here with just a few thoughts on why, uh, our first on our panel and then a few thoughts on why uh, this event uh, today with this group um, of experts. We do have a superb group um, gathered for you uh, of experts on entrepreneurship. Mauricio Miller, of course. Mauricio is a social entrepreneur, public speaker, and author of The Alternative, Most of What You Believe About Poverty is Wrong. He's based out in Oakland, California. In fact, the first piece that I wrote uh, about uh, his work uh, for AEI was called Adam Smith by the Bay. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that he ever really adopted that uh, for himself, but that's the way I think of Mauricio as somebody who's really, uh, he reminds me so much of the work of Adam Smith. Uh, he's a longtime administrator um, pre in, his, in his earlier life, longtime administrator of uh, anti-poverty programs. And he was the founder of the Family Independence and Community Independence um, Initiatives. John Danner is a professor at Princeton University and University of California at Berkeley. He's a public speaker and an author on entrepreneurship and venture development. And then we have Cornelia Hulstrunk, executive director of Princeton's Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. And the connection of that is that Cornelia's center actually helps students at Princeton sort of shape and develop their own entrepreneurial ideas. So in addition to engineering, there's a lot of design thinking and uh, helping people uh, develop uh, their business plans. So uh, that's that's who you're gonna be hearing from today. And now we'll go to kind of uh, what I mentioned earlier about some framing comments about how I think about Mauricio's work uh, and why I'm so excited to have him here today um, to talk about this paper that he recently wrote for AEI on entrepreneurship. So I think the central question um, that all of us face as we're seeking to um, build a, um, 
uh, a more equitable society and support flourishing in low-income communities is what's the role of government and what's the role of society? You know, since, since the Great Society and the War on Poverty programs from the, uh, in the mid-1960s, government has really occupied uh, the center stage, I think, in answering this question. Federal programs um, targeted at reducing poverty and increasing individual, family, and community well-being have often been focused on trying to reshape uh, entire society, community, society, the moral life of low-income people through various interventions along the life course, for everything from Head Start to our criminal justice system. Um, Recent evaluation data from several um, programs suggests that there may be another course to consider. And I want to emphasize at this point that what you're, what you're hearing uh, from me and, and through this presentation is not the suggestion that we need to dismantle uh, the uh, federal and state and federally funded and state uh, administered um, social and human services, economic development programs um, but that we need to be open to considering some new options. And I really, that's the way I really think about, um, about the material we're going to be covering today. And the reason I say we need to be open to it, uh, open to that, is that there's been some recent evaluation data that suggests that there may be this other alternative course to consider. And I would just want to give you a few examples. I won't spend too much time on this, but I think it's very important to sort of give you what the, the empirical basis for, for what the work that Mauricio is doing, uh, why that may be something very valuable for us to consider. So uh, there's a 2016 HUD evaluation of a homelessness, um, homeless family program uh, that tried three different approaches um, to supporting homeless families two of which involved to greater or lesser degrees sort of intensive wraparound services combined with housing. Um, and then one, and then the, the third approach that was tested was just housing. Um, and, and whatever other services a family chose to access, uh, they could do that uh, at their own discretion, but there wasn't much in the way of guidance what was interesting about that evaluation, it was done by Apt Associates, a uh, major um, evaluation firm uh, here in uh, the DC area, um, found that the rental assistance without social services, the participants in that third bucket of, um, of the trial performed uh, much, much better, and it wasn't close than the ones that were receiving both the housing assistance and the uh, in, intensive kind of wraparound uh, social services. Um, there's also been the, the second bullet here, a meta review of evaluation data relating to um, reentry programs, uh, prisoner reentry programs. And that's an area that another area that I focus on at AEI. And this meta review um, uh, found that um, that the control groups the, uh, who were studied as part of these evaluations, the ones who did not receive services, frequently did as well or better than the people who did receive uh, the, the service package that was being tested. Um, and that's a, a jarring thing for me, um, that not only um, don't our programs sort of improve, but there may be a way in which they actually make um, the situation worse um, for people who are returning from prison. And then finally, the moving to success evaluation, which was a um, Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, that provided um, low-income families with resources to move to different neighborhoods, to access better schools, to uh, access safer communities. Um, without really much beyond that, um, that, uh, that support to actually just move to a, a, to a different place. 
Um, and it was interesting because when it was first evaluated, um, the evaluators couldn't find much uh, in terms of positive outcomes. But then they looked at the outcomes of the kids, the children who were in those families who moved, what their adult outcomes were. And what they found was that, especially for the younger children, the ones who had the least exposure to the trauma and danger of the neighborhood that they used to belong, uh, live in, um, that their outcomes were much, much better. And again, this is not a, this is a self-directed um, approach to assisting families um, rather than a, you know, a, an intensive kind of uh, social services intervention approach. You can go ahead and advance. Okay, so our speaker today, um, Marisu Miller, uh, has been engaged in this, what I call less helping. He calls it no help, uh, which I think uh, I, I appreciate the sentiment behind that, no helping. But in fact, it's just a different kind of help. But he's been involved in this, this less helping approach for decades. His family independence, independence initiative, which is now called Up Together, and the community uh, independence initiative seek to flip the script on economic development and social services. And the overall thrust of Mauricio's work is that poor people, low-income people, families, communities, they have talent, they have energy and drive, but they lack access to capital and social networks that can help grow their businesses and communities. So it's really an asset um, focused approach to community development, um, really thinking about uh, the, the families and the individuals in low income communities as uh, problem solvers, um, people who are able to have ideas, they have drive, they have energy, they have uh, entrepreneurship built into them, and they need some assistance, not in necessarily in terms of uh, money or a heavy hand from the government, but but uh, some support in developing their social networks and building access uh, to capital. So that's Mauricio's big idea. It's not to stop helping, but to support people in developing their own opportunities and find solutions to their own problems, problems and challenges. So today's paper builds on the uh, insight of uh, the Family Independence Initiative's philosophy of low-income entrepreneurship and supporting uh, uh, low-income entrepreneurs without burdening them. Um, uh, he will be talking to us about an innovative micro-venture micro -venture capital project operating in Liberia that he's been overseeing that spurs the formation of stronger lo local economies. And one of the main questions I'm interested in exploring today is whether this kind of an approach uh, might be helpful to um, this country. We so often think about the United States exporting expertise and programs and resources to the developing world, but can this approach that Mauricio has been developing in West Africa be brought back to the United States as a way of helping entrepreneurs in the United States rebuild after COVID-19? So with that, I'm going to turn uh, this presentation over to Mauricio, who is the, um, the, the, the man of the hour here, and have him um, walk us through this wonderful paper that he's written for us and um, tell us how all of this works. All right. Well, thank you, Brent. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity and kind of being here with everybody. Um, what I can tell you is that I'm not well read. Um, I don't know uh, that I know any of the studies. I do know the organizations that you're talking about. Um, so what, I guess what my approach is, uh, has a lot to do with sort of my personal experience and that somehow the experience in terms of what I lived through and then for last 40 years, I've been working you know, directly with what ends up being thousands of very low income families, heavily refugees and immigrants, both in this country and then internationally. But, you know, to start with, it had a lot to do with my experience. So I was raised by a single mom, uh, two kids that uh, she was Mexican, had a third grade education, uh, 
we moved from Mexico to San Jose, California when I was about nine years old. And it was like for the same reason that most immigrants come here. It's like she wanted uh, at least for our family to have better opportunities. And the United States did provide, I guess, better opportunities. I, I say that with hesitation because in terms of my uh, sister and my mother, uh, things did not go well. Uh, it was really difficult for them for whatever we think of the opportunities in the United States. There tend to be many, many more barriers than we believed, but uh, everything got focused on me and somehow or other, I'm the one that benefited from the sacrifices made. And, and I guess I do this work because this country and the world does not have to have people sacrifice as much as my family did. And so I guess that's sort of what, well, what are the lessons? Um, Brent indicated that I ran social service programs for about 20 years. I think about, um, you know, after my mother passed and, and you know, my sister's life was really hard, I did join the war on poverty. And so I was running, you know, social service programs I, from entrepreneurship to gang kids to housing. I built affordable housing to urban planning, you name it. Uh, I kept thinking that, you know, somehow or other we were going to be able to develop programs to help everybody. And um, however, about two months into the whole thing, uh, I realized that there were some fundamental flaws in how we were approaching all this. Within five to 10 years, I realized I wouldn't bring my own nephew and nieces who were basically going through what very low income families go through. It's just really stressful and really difficult and um, that I wouldn't bring them through my own services. And so I started getting really depressed because we were actually getting really well recognized for our services. And um, then when you feel like, well, if they're not good enough for my family, then what am I doing? The other thing was that I, by this time, I had graduated out of UC Berkeley as an engineer because my mother told me to be an engineer. Uh, I had to earn money for our family. Uh, it was that or be a doctor and people would have died if I became a doctor. So I became an engineer, not a good engineer, but I did like data and stats. Um, and for me, as I was learning that I wouldn't bring my own family through my services, I actually became very depressed about the whole thing. If we were some, considered uh, some of the best services in the country, then something was wrong with our standards. So I got an opportunity in 2001 from then Mayor Jerry Brown. Um, he called me up at home. My programs were fairly well known. He called me up at home and basically complained that after 30 some years of the war on poverty, we had fundamentally, fundamentally changed nothing. We had made poverty tolerable for those that became eligible to the eligibility criteria in our programs. And, and I had been doing that, right? I could help people actually become a little bit better in terms of what their food might, might be or their housing situation might be. But like I said, my mother didn't come to this country to live in tolerable poverty. Almost nobody does that. So we all really want to take advantage of what the history had been, which is immigrants and refugees have built so much of this country and somehow or other they had been able to get ahead. So for me then, when Jerry Brown said, you know, you guys really aren't doing anything and, and the challenge that changed my life was, so what would you do if you could really do anything you wanted to do? And for all of you, if you're on this podcast, that's sort of the challenge. I mean, so if you really want things to change, I mean, Brent said it and whatever, this world can be better. So what would we do? The dilemma that happened after two, I'd say two weeks of pondering my history and growing up in these neighborhoods, and then all the programs that I knew, I knew my programs really well and whatever, and I had a scheduled appointment to meet with Jerry Brown and tell him what I would do. I realized after two weeks of pondering everything that I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And if any of you think you know what to do, you're crazy. Humanity is just not that linear. You know, it just does not react to structure in the same way. And yet we tend to tr want to structure everything. So essentially when Jerry yeah, at the meeting asked me, so what would you do? And, and I told him, I don't know what I would do, but I think that each of the families would have a better idea of what to do to help themselves and help each other. And what I'm willing to do, if you will back me, is to collect the data and the stories of what families do for themselves and each other. And I promised him, 
no social, I had 120 staff when he engaged me. Don't, no social workers, no direction from any of my staff. This is a research project to understand the capacity of families to help themselves and help each other. And out, out of that, we're bound to learn something. Now, nobody backs you like that, except Jerry's a little, you know, he's really interesting. And so he was interested, okay, maybe, you know, we'll learn something from that. I can tell you within, uh, you know, this was all in Oakland and San Francisco. Okay, so what happened within two years that incomes start going up, people start helping each other. A lot of the things that I had seen when I was growing up start happening when we had stepped out of the way, when my program staff was told, if you help, I'm gonna fire you. And I did fire for staff for trying to be helpful. It screws up the data. So essentially it's like, well, what is kind of going on here? And so a lot of it over the last 20 years have been to learn. So what is the dynamic that really led to, if you go his, historically, the black townships coming on out of slavery, right? Here you had a population that was really put down, was kept uneducated and whatever, and yet they built entire microeconomies. And this is where we're starting to get into entrepreneurship. Uh, same thing with the Chinatowns. We had a Chinatown here in San Francisco, and I saw people from Hong Kong and immigrants from China kind of going in there and coming out and doing better than they were when they went through my programs. So this is a dynamic of there is some other natural process of change that happens that we're not addressing. And so even as Brent was telling you about the AB, ABT and, and MDRC doing these evaluations, whatever, they're all evaluations of our interventions. And what we don't have is really what is the picture within the community itself? And that's what Jerry actually in his curiosity helped me to try to understand. So we were actually surveying the families every month. Okay, so what are you doing? You know, what's working, what's not working and whatever. And what we found is that people were learning from each other. So my mother, when we moved into a neighborhood, she first of all would say, you know, for all the stereotype of low income folks and immigrants being criminals and rapists and whatever, it's like she said, you know, there's some houses over there and those kids over there and you have to stay away from them. You know, the rest of the 90 percent of our neighbors were good people. You know, and so she would make friends with some of them. But the stereotype was wrong. No, it's you know, they depict us all like that 5 percent or 10 percent over there. You have to stay away from them. And that what she would do is through our neighbors, she would learn, you know, well, how do you apply for college? We, we, had no, we had no knowledge of what college really would be like other than she wanted me to go to college, right? And so a lot of it was sort of learning. And the other thing was that the one thing that this country does really help is that there are jobs here. Now, for her, it was either being a dishwasher or stocking at a stocking shelves at a grocery store, but she was able to become a bookkeeping clerk. She was good with numbers. But the trouble with getting a job in the United States and any of the developed countries is that these are all dead end jobs. For all that people talk about education being the way to get ahead, of, you know, she knew that was true for me a generation later, but not for her and my sister right now. So the dilemma we have with the employment system for very low income folks is they go into dead end jobs and they're lucky if they get a cost of living increase. So how was she going to, because I would see her every month at the end of the month trying to figure out which bills am I going to pay? Are we going to have enough food, et cetera? So the issue for her was that we were earning enough to survive, but not to save money for me to go to college. So what she did is she was an became an entrepreneur. She was good at making dresses. And so she started becoming a dressmaker. That was her talent. Okay, that's where she could have started a shop. She wanted to have a dress shop. She wanted to really increase all of that. And what she found is that there was no investment system for her. And the same thing with Camilla, her best friend did tamales and had a bunch of Mexican delicacies. She had a customer base. She wanted to really start, you know, a cart and then have a restaurant and whatever. Again, there was no investment system to recognize her talents. Like she was classified like my mother as a charity case, you know, that they were somehow nothing, had nothing to contribute. So for me, then that was the experience I was growing up with. That was the experience I was seeing with these families that Jerry Brown then said, OK, collect the stories. So I saw that they had these other talents and that getting a job was just not the only thing that could really get them get it, let them get ahead. That entrepreneurship 
was forced. So what ended up happening is then I became really interested in entrepreneurship. Okay, so if it's not jobs. So I decided to go to Liberia. In Liberia, they, there's just not much of an economy after two civil wars and Ebola and, and now you know COVID that the economy and corporations along with government do not produce enough jobs to even be a security guard or be a dishwasher. That, you know, if you think about that, then were people starving in the street and whatever? I didn't see that at all. I visited there in 2017 and all I saw was entrepreneurship, that those families had to create their own economy and that they did create their own economy. They were creating jobs for each other. And in that, you know, what, you know, the, the data kind of showed for us as I looked at the data is again, we would survey them on a monthly basis as I did in the United States. And what I saw is that the incomes for those families, I worked with a hundred families that were our sample in Liberia, that their income jumped 250% within six months. It was a huge jump. And before I got there, I told you they were already doing something. They were already employing like uh, 70 or 80 part-time helpers with their little businesses, you know, because they had to go take care of their child. Somebody else helped them and whatever. That after we then start testing investments with them, which is what we're going to talk about, that uh, that's when their income jumped 250% and they created another 80 or 90 jobs. So they were job creators. This is the same time that Firestorm Corporation, the biggest corporation in Liberia, was cutting jobs. And the government obviously was not expanding. So somehow or other, this whole other world isn't even looked at. You know, I'm working with IPA in Liberia and Uganda, and they've just never even thought of trying to research what families do for themselves and each other, which becomes a really, really huge problem. And the piece I'm going to leave you with that Cornelia and John, I think, can really help you is that I was asked to teach a class about this approach by Cornelia, thank you, uh, last year in 2020. Um, of course, COVID hit, but it didn't matter. Um, what happened is that in teaching that class, I became much more familiar with how supportive Princeton University is of its students. Now, I, I have an attitude about, <laughs> about the elite, okay? <laughs> but. I, I must admit, you know, there was a lot of support. And then, you know, she asked me to sit on this ELAB committee over the summer. And the thing that was interesting about the Keller Center is that it tends to be very supportive of entrepreneurship. And the ELAB was really set up to look at ventures that the students, these 19, 20 year olds or whatever, the ventures that they're putting together. So it's really encouraged, go try to figure out, you know, some kind of business venture that, you know, could grow and whatever. And we on the eLab advisory board were the mentors. So, you know, they, these students the, that had these ideas could actually get mentoring. Uh, and then what ended up happening is that we would talk about having an investment fund, uh, which, you know, I want to talk to more, maybe it'll be in the discussion that, um, that somehow or other, the, the two groups that were that I was involved with, one of them actually wanted to sell crumpets uh, in America. And they had no experience selling any of this stuff. But remember, I knew Camilla, who, which was my mother's best friend, selling Mexican delicacies and whatever. And what I saw is these students getting all of this mentorship and support and advisement and encouragement, and that they were actually gonna be able to get, you know, a venture fund that could invest some, some equity like uh, uh, startup funds and whatever in them. The other one was another group that was trying to design dresses and, and um, uh, essentially garments for quote, angry young people. Now, my mother did dresses for quinceañeras, which are not angry people, but again, it was just like, so here's this 19, 20 year olds getting all of this support. And there was no expectation that they would succeed. This was all of, these are the, the this is the generation that's gonna create our economy. They're gonna create jobs. The, the way, you know, if you're a student, and I saw this when I went to Berkeley, if you're a student in an elite institution or you're part of an elite social network, you're seen as a potential contributor to society. While at the same time, my mother and Camilla and my neighbors 
were seen as takers from society. We were potential criminals. It just was a very different environment that got no support and wasn't even looked at. So for me, that contradiction is what led to the paper that you said, it's like, this is kind of crazy. And then in going to Liberia and I start seeing again, the capacity that people had and that as refugees and you know, that came to this country, they still had that capacity that somehow or other, I felt like we're really missing something and that what we need to do is re-educate ourselves. The problem are not these families, the problem is ourselves and our systems. So Mauricio, just, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just, uh, I wanna make sure that you cover the, not just the nuts and bolts of how the project in Liberia worked. Uh, you talked about the big increases in employment and wages and so on, but how did it actually, how did that project actually operate? In terms of operating, it's like, um, we still hold to what I promised Jerry, we do not interfere. So my staff is told from the very beginning, you cannot provide any counseling, advice, direction, teaching, or anything like that. We're here to learn from the families. Um, as such, because I'm a data person, says I need to know what they're doing. Now, I used to in the US hire evaluation firms like MDRC or whatever to go out and interview these families and collect the data. And it cost me a ton of money. At that time, their principal got paid $150 an hour. And you know, it was like, so instead in the discussion with Jerry is I'm willing to pay these families if they give me verifiable data on a monthly basis online. So the way it works is that we collect data on a monthly basis from these families. And in low income areas, what we do is we pay them for their time. We pay them the equivalent of what would be a good wage. So in Liberia, we pay them $10 a month to both give us verifiable data about their income, what they're doing, et cetera, as well as to meet and tell us the stories behind the data because data can be very misleading. So that's the, the basics of the program is we could do that on a monthly basis. We're starting in Uganda in a refugee camp. The first survey is going out right now. They were asking kind of the same thing. What happens is that you first, families when we first engage them uh, in the United States or, or internationally, they're expecting to be told what to do. It's already embedded that somehow or other when anybody from the outside comes in, we're in a power position and they have to try to figure out how to fit our criteria. So the families have a really difficult time saying, you're, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, my staff, is, I can't tell you anything, you know, it's, it's really up to you. But we collect the base data for about four months. And in the four month period, they realize they're not gonna get any advice from us. And so then they start really revealing what they're doing to survive. And I told you, they're surviving, they're creating jobs and whatever. So the issue for us is then to get that data and then we feed that data back to the family so they can see how they're doing. And then what we do is we look at the community as a whole and we feed back data about how the rest of the families are doing. What ends up happening is that within any grouping, behavioral studies will tell you there are what call, are called positive deviants. Somebody figures a way around all the barriers and they start doing better. They're thought as exceptions right now the fact is, no, they can be role models. And so what we do is we share the data of what other people are doing and the positive deviance kind of show up. In Liberia, the positive deviation was, and I was told this was gonna happen by the families, is that in developing countries, we've told them to take debt. We've told them the way to expand is go to Kiva and the loan programs or whatever. And what was interesting to me is on the eLab committee, we would specifically tell the students, you never can start a business and expand the business, whatever, uh, on debt. You need, you need equity like capital. You need your father to invest in you or you know, you know, whatever it would be like that. But um, in low income communities, when I first went to Liberia, they asked me, so are you another loan program? I was like, no. And they were like, okay, then we'll talk to you. So Liberia had already gotten its family so much in debt that when we gave them a small investment, what the woman told me is that, see, I used to buy these locks one at a time on retail because I didn't have any capital. And then I often had to travel to Monrovia to buy it, which cost me money. And then, you know, sometimes I didn't have any money and I had to actually get the locks on credit. So by the time I sold them for a few pennies more in Buchanan, 
that I made no money, I could survive. But if you give us a small amount of capital, I can buy these at wholesale. I can buy packs of six and we can all make more money. And I can tell you, that's what we track. And that's where that 250% uh, percent jump happened is that people then were able to get through some of the debt that we have talked them into taking the Grameen Bank and microcredit. It is not a good thing. Um, and yet that's really what we offer to folks. So. So you actually were involved in injecting some capital into these businesses. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So the first thing, then I want to get to Cornelian Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing was that um, I didn't know. Remember, I talked to the families when I was in 2017. And they told me if we had a little bit of capital, we could do this, which did happen. Right. And so what I decided to do is I didn't know which families of the hundred would do what. And so I gave each of the families that were participating a hundred dollar investment, just a hundred dollars. Right. And it was going to be, well, let's see who the positive deviants are, who does the best with that investment. So for Bill Gates and for, uh, you know, uh, what's his name that, uh, so a lot of the folks that developed is that their parents were that first investors. I invested in my daughter's first business, which was kind of a henna business and, and whatever. So it's like, so, this is sort of what we had to fill in. It's like, well, what would happen if you didn't have to worry every month about surviving this whole thing? And could we see positive deviants come out? And, and obviously we saw a lot in Liberia. So at that point in time, we did the hundred dollars. Now what we're doing is we're going to do more of what Princeton is doing, which is they've set up the prospect student and venture fund, I believe. Right. And yeah. So what they've done is then, you know, students can submit, proposals in terms of their business. And I think they funded at least two, two of my students are in the committee on that. And so they basically can get this small, it's really it's grants, right? It's not equity itself, but it's grants, but it's like your parents or whatever, you know, it's not really debt, but you have to do well, you know? So it, essentially then what we're doing is setting, setting up and I haven't filled in John or Cornelia, we're setting up our own committee uh, and we're going to set up our own investment fund. I hope like in October, we'll start setting that up. And we're gonna then start having the, the families submit their business proposals, not in the same formal way or whatever, because these are micro, this is like when you're talking to your dad about, could you help me start a henna business, right? So it's gonna be at that level, we call it stage one seed capital for us. And we are then gonna invest in the various to see how many jobs they can create, Really, can they be role models, et cetera, et cetera? And are they willing to then invest in other people, which is what we have seen? Yeah. So let's uh, and we're going to go immediately to Cornelia after you answer this question. But what's the requirement? That's what I wanted to get to. What's the requirement that you do impose on people when you give them the money? You can oh. have this money, but what do you have to do? What's the uh, in terms of... Um, uh, at, at trying to build stronger economic networks in the community. Well, you probably have something in mind because you actually know the project pretty well. <laughs> but um, maybe two things. One is that that I should mention is that we do pay them ten dollars a month, uh, and we do that as hiring them as consultants. So rather than hiring Abt or MDRC to, or IPA to do my evaluations, I hire the families. So. Uh, basically, we tell them, here's a part time job for you. If you don't give me verifiable data on a monthly basis on time, uh, we will fire you. <laughs> I've never had to fire a low income family, but we will fire you. This is a part time job. Right. And so they need to look at it. As soon as we say it's a part time job and we're learning from their data, it starts to shift the power position. Remember, they're used to actually having to give this data for free. Mm -hmm. And then it's used to bring in something else from the outside. In this particular case, as soon as we do that, and as soon as they see me fire somebody, they're like, oh, this is really different. That power shift is really important because until you do that power shift, you don't truly see the capacity of these families because they're trying to figure out how to please us to get access to what we have. We've controlled resources for so long <laughs> that they're trying to fit into our eligibility criteria. So that first baseline period is really a power shift. The second thing in terms of the investment, we tell them we're really transparent about all this. It's like people think you don't have any capacity to use $100. So show us something. But if you do, 
Okay, if you do something, then you have a responsibility to pay it forward. You have a responsibility to help others. Now in Liberia, they were already helping people that were more impoverished in more impoverished areas and whatever. So this was not a big deal to them. It says, oh yeah, we do that anyway. So for here, it's a requirement. Yeah, it's kind of a requirement, but they're already doing it. They love helping other people, especially now that they can do more of it. The other thing we require them is that, okay, if anybody else comes in that has a similar issue or a problem, we're not gonna answer any of those questions. You're gonna help them. They love being the teachers. And so now what we've done is we're hooking up, we're connecting the families in Liberia with the families in Uganda. And their payment for the investment we made is they now are the primary consultants to the families and liaisons in Uganda. This becomes much more of peer to peer as opposed to having a lot of professionals over here, it's this peer to peer. This is the way my mother saw it expand. A Mexican would talk to a Mexican, but then we'd run into a Puerto Rican that had done something that we were interested in. That transfer is always the way it had worked. The black townships, the Chinatowns and whatever is all peer to peer. And so what we're looking at developing right now is a new field. Right now, everything has been war on poverty programs, institutions and whatever. We're starting a new field that's being called peer driven change. And we need to get people to understand that. The, and this is where Princeton can really help. We need research done. So again, Cornelia put me into this tiger challenge and it's really interesting. The students are realizing there is almost no research being done about the capacity of the families themselves and that they contribute to society. Terrific, thank <laughs> you. You nailed it, you nailed it. Okay, um, okay Cornelia, uh, we're gonna turn this to you and I know you've got uh, some slides for us to look at um, and kind of walk us through your work and how it connects to what Mauricio is doing. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. And Mauricio, uh, it was a delight to have you on campus and to continue working with you on all the wonderful work you're doing. You. So uh, it's, it's a real privilege. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Keller Center and also our programs. But before I do, I thought I would start with um, just a little bit of a reflection on some of what Mauricio has chatted about. So next slide, please. Okay, so I was really taken, actually, Mauricio, as you know, uh, by your concepts of makers and takers. And I have um, summarized from your paper, I hope somewhat approximately, chime in if I'm incorrect here, uh, you know, makers are those in privileged social circles that are seen as contributors to society. And takers are those that are living in and, in and around the poverty line and they're viewed as takers. Uh, I wanted to introduce another group of individuals um, that I think play a big role, definitely in academia, and might be a really interesting conduit group to think about, and those are strivers. So strivers, this is a term that was, I believe, coined uh, by Jennifer Morton. She's a philosophy um, professor, and she wrote a book called Moving Up Without Losing Your Way. It's actually the Princeton pre-read this year for incoming freshman students. And it talks a lot about the costs, the ethical uh, trade-offs that first-generation students uh, um, experience when they come to these elite institutions. Uh, but bottom line is they, um, they play somewhat of a chameleon role. They are in um, these privileged social circles uh, suddenly and by association uh, could be viewed as makers, but they still have the language and the experience and the connection to their communities in ways that a many of the um, more uh, advantaged students do not. And so at Princeton, uh, I wanna say about 25% of the student body actually falls into this category. These are students that are Pell Grant eligible, um, you know, first generation students. and. Frankly, that's one of the reasons I'm particularly proud to work at the university is that it is um, uh, has made such big efforts to try to attract these students. Um, so I think understanding um, how we can leverage that group of individuals more uh, is hugely important, uh, especially as a lot of entrepreneurs try to create social solutions for um, problems in communities that these strivers are incredibly experienced with. Um, and and it, these are their home communities. And uh, it's, it's very challenging for them because they often feel, and this is a quote from her book, uh, that their home culture is disrespected and devalued by those in middle-class worlds. 
um, that they now inhabit. So I just wanted to toss that out as, as maybe just an extension of our conversation as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, thanks. All right, I, I think the other uh, piece, uh, Mauricio, that I think is really exciting about your work is the data-driven piece of it. Um, and tied into that, I think, is also uh, the need uh, to change the narrative around entrepreneurship. So at, at Princeton, uh, we, we think very frequently about the need to have a broad understanding of entrepreneurship. So one that goes well beyond uh, you know, a Silicon Valley type model, <laughs> one where entrepreneurship is just high growth ventures uh, that are supported through venture capital. Uh, and that absolutely discounts the other sectors of entrepreneurial activity that are actually such engines um, within our society. So I think um, until we have sort of a broader understanding uh, of who is an entrepreneur, let's start with that. <laughs> and it's not just, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, privileged white uh, or Asian uh, computer science student. It's, um, it's much broader than that. Uh, it's, it's folks from, from all parts of life um, and all, all sorts of demographics. Uh, and I think once we, once we start thinking about a broader, broader understanding of that uh, and then think about how we're gonna measure that, uh, that's how, how we'll start changing the narrative. And once we have a new narrative, that's when I think the policy and, and, and all the support systems and the way we treat this, this space uh, will change. All right, so I wanted to give a little bit of background now on actually our work at Princeton. And for those of you on the call, um, many of you might be surprised that, that Princeton is actually a relatively small place. Um, it has uh, 5,500 undergraduate students and about uh, 2,800 or so graduate students. Uh, four main divisions, uh, the humanities, the social sciences, natural sciences, and engineering. But we have no business school, we have no design school, no law or medical school. Uh, and so a lot of the um, efforts around innovation are actually housed within the School of Engineering, which is where the Keller Center is housed. And the Keller Center serves as the innovation center on campus uh, for the entire uh, campus community. So let's move on, please. So uh, we are focused on harnessing academic excellence for societal impact. Uh, and uh, this, the second part of our uh, mission statement is a little bit of a uh, play on the university's mission statement, which uh, is innovation in the nation's, uh, which is um, service in the nation's uh, uh, service and in service of humanity. So we now have innovation. <laughs> All right, so next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, so we have three main areas. I think, uh, Brent, you alluded to these, but we have uh, a focus on innovation, on entrepreneurship and design. Uh, you can keep moving. Next slide. Okay. Uh, we have what we call a very a seamless integration of both curricular and co-curricular programs. So curricular are obviously courses and co-curricular are all the activities that happen outside of the classroom. And Mauricio mentioned quite a few of these, uh, so I'll go into those into in more depth on the next slide. All right, uh, actually, uh, before I do, uh, we have 25 courses. Uh, we have um, students from all across campus represented in those. And I think I see John on the picture on the bottom teaching a class. There you go, John. <laughs> Um, we have two minors, uh, so you can see it's a really dynamic and robust uh, center. Great. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the co-curricular programs, these are actually some of these programs that Mauricio was referring to, where students receive tremendous amount of support. Um, uh, the type of support really that any entrepreneur would have um, benefited from tremendously. So the first is the eLab which is uh, that 10 week long summer program where students, uh, independent of whether or not their startups will have success, <laughs> are supported, are absolutely supported by the university. So students receive um, uh, seed funding for their startups. Uh, they receive mentorship, uh, both external to the university and internal. So they're usually matched with a content expert, someone that knows about their business. They're matched with someone that knows how to start a startup. 
uh, they are connected with a faculty uh, within Keller Center that can advise them. And um, at the end of the summer, they also have the opportunity to present their ideas to others who may take their ideas up and, and, and move them forward. So it's a tremendous um, engine to really support uh, uh, the innovations of these young students. The Tiger Challenge, which was the other project that, that Mauricio uh, mentioned, that is, a pro that is a program that uses design thinking. So students use design thinking to create solutions to challenges uh, in the community. Um, so these could be innovations that are inserted in existing systems. Um, uh, so they work very, very, very closely with, with uh, let's say, municipalities and, and the like. Uh, the Princeton Startup Immersion Program is an internship program. Again, a wonderful program for these students. Talk about sort of the types of experience as they're exposed to at, at a place like Princeton, where they uh, work with early stage capital, uh, early stage companies in three locations, either in New York or Tel Aviv or Shanghai for 10 weeks. And uh, the other one is the Prospect Student Ventures that Mauricio was talking about. So maybe I should dwell on this a little bit more. This is a new group. Um, it's actually a uh, student-run initiative that is housed within our center. Uh, we give them a lot of mentorship. These are students that are eager to learn how to do venture capital. Uh, and more specifically, they started this venture group to support um, startups by students that fall in that striver category, actually. These are students that may not have the resources from home, not the family and friends investment right at the beginning uh, to support their ventures. And um, we all know that entrepreneurship, uh, being able to become an entrepreneur after graduation means you need to have a pretty tight safety net. <laughs> you know, it, it, you need that type of support. And a lot of students do not. Um, so this Prospect Student Ventures is, is an initiative to help support uh, those types of students. Okay, so that's that's my portion of the formal presentation. I think, John, you're next. Thanks, Cornelia. <laughs> Brent, Mauricio, uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some ideas and, and, and thoughts with you folks. Um, I have a, a couple of rare privileges. Uh, I get a chance to teach for the portion of my portfolio that involves teaching at both uh, one of the finest public universities in the world, the University of California, Berkeley, where I teach at the business school. Uh, and also at Princeton, which is one of the finest private universities in the world. And at both places, uh, I had a chance to create uh, what has become the kind of social entrepreneurship curriculum for the uh, on campus. And that's the lens through which I wanted to comment a little bit on some of the points that, that have been made earlier. Um, let me kind of set it in, in global terms, if I could, for a second, and I'll pick up some, some terms that have been used before. You know, if you look at the world of whatever it is, seven and a half billion people, and you thought about it in three basic groups, you have people at the top. All of us on this call are kind of people on the top, presumably. We're the people that are thriving. We're the people that are benefiting from the various political and social and economic systems that have been created uh, by, our, by our ancestors. The vast group of people in the middle, anywhere from four to five billion of that seven and a half, are what I would characterize as strivers. They're not yet at the point that we are. They're striving to move up somehow or another. And that leaves at the bottom of, the, of this economic and social pyramid, a billion to two billion people who I might characterize as survivors. That's what they're focused on. These people don't have a choice about becoming entrepreneurs. They're not what's known as opportunity entrepreneurs. They are, they are entrepreneurs by necessity. If they're not out hustling, if they're not out trying to figure out how to sell the next thing, their, their family doesn't get fed, their kids don't have clothes, they can't go to school, whatever it may be, but, but they're in a different reality. Brent mentioned Adam Smith uh, early on. We all love Adam Smith when, when, when we're worshiping capitalism, but you know, Adam Smith was focused on the wealth of nations, not the wealth of individuals. And in fact, Adam Smith, we sometimes have an a la carte view of, of his notion. We love the free market. We love the invisible hand. We like division of labor. But Adam Smith's philosophy was grounded on some moral obligations. He, was, he, he said, all that's great, but not at the expense of a society that can't afford to create a, an adequate social net at the bottom for people to live with the basic necessities. And I think that's the fundamental challenge that Mauricio has been dealing with uh, in his work and others around the world. It's the question of, of which ism 
is that bottom group of survivors and that next group of strivers going to believe in for the next generation and beyond? If capitalism is going to be the answer to that, we have to go back to some basics because presumably one of the key questions that every entrepreneur faces, whether they're trying to get rich or change the world or some combination of both, is to answer the acronym that I suspect many people on the call are familiar with, WIFM, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? That's the ultimate question that, that an entrepreneur has to ask, but it's also the ultimate question that an entrepreneur has to answer for their investors and for their customers. And I think one of the things that is apparent as you look at this emerging fourth sector that I call the, the sort of social entrepreneurship sector, it's not government, it's not pure private sector, it's not the nonprofit sector, it's something that has elements of all three of those, but it's doing something quite different. It's creating value with new kinds of business models. I think what, what Mauricio is suggesting is that we need to go from a, a focus on poverty, a focus on poverty elimination, to shift from thinking about it as two people or even four people to with people. Because if the definition of entrepreneurship makes sense from Howard Stevenson at Harvard Business School, which I've kind of bastardized over the years, the definition I use is that entrepreneurship is the pursuit and creation of business opportunities to create value beyond the resources you control. Now, if you think about that, most, entre most entrepreneurs in any capacity don't have a lot of resources. They don't have money, they don't have time, they don't have technology, they don't have a team, they don't have customers, they don't have, they don't have facilities. But what they do have is themselves. They do have the power of their own initiative and the promise of their ideas to begin to convert those ideas and that initiative and that energy and that tenacity into value for themselves, for their families, for their communities, potentially also for their investors. And I think what's intriguing among many things about what Mauricio has been doing both in Liberia and the US is that he basically is showing that there's a way for us to take this notion of equity and talk about it in both senses. It's the equity in the sense of fairness, and it's equity in the sense of ownership. Because if we have an ability to provide actual ownership capital in small doses to begin with, perhaps the $100, to people in these communities who themselves have the energy, have the ideas, have the wherewithal, but also are very isolated oftentimes, they don't have that mutual network. They don't have the support that my students and, and, and Cornelio and Mauricio students at, at Princeton uh, have the luxury of. But if we, can, if we can give them an opportunity with money to try those ideas, to take those first steps, to get to what I sometimes call the sort of first 100, you know, I have a, I advise a, a social entrepreneur, a very wonderful organization called We Care Solar. It's providing solar lanterns to maternity clinics around the world. What they've discovered is the power of the first hundred watts. Now, just think about that. The first hundred watts of light in a maternal health clinic that suddenly allows women to give birth at night without kerosene lights, without, without flashlights, et cetera. The first hundred watts. Think about the first hundred steps to becoming an entrepreneur. Think about the power of the first hundred customers for an entrepreneur. And then put that in the context of Mauricio's first hundred dollars of equity capital. Capital that is an investment in those individuals. And to some extent, I think the biggest mistake we often make when we look at these grassroots, quote, bootstrap entrepreneurs is we forget that as you go down in the economic pyramid, Folks have more straps than boots. You know, when we're talking about Silicon Valley style entrepreneurs, you can talk about bootstraps, but in that sense, you're talking about booting up a computer, booting up a computer that you own with cell phone that you cell phone coverage you can pay for on an internet that the government built. But when you get down lower in, in poverty, you're talking about people who have all the right wherewithal in their own heads between their ears but the resources are missing. And the resources of capital or forgivable debt, I wouldn't quite be as, as, as doctrinaire as Mauricio sometimes is about no debt, no debt, no debt. I think debt can be fine as long as it's forgivable, as long as there is the safety net that the rest of us as entrepreneurs have available called bankruptcy, for example.
<laughs> you know, called no recourse, no recourse financing. That's there is some kind of good debt. So all of this is to say, I think that that Mauricio is on to something powerful. Um, I often tell my students, you know, entre is the mantra. You, you don't do this alone. You do this with other resources. You do it with other people. And if we can unlock with small equity investments, the power and energy and potential within the ears of entrepreneurs at the grassroots level, helping them do what they already know how to do and want to do and have the drive to do, uh, we all are going to be better off for it. And in that sense, we may actually fulfill the second part of what Adam Smith urged us to do more than 150 years ago. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, really, uh, excellent thoughts from all of you, of course, uh, but I appreciated your uh, your words there particularly. Um, it's not, not necessarily widely known uh, about Adam Smith, but his first and most important work was a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is all about this question of how it is that human beings develop uh, this idea of reciprocity. Uh, and you talked about, you know, equity in the sense of fairness, equity in the sense of ownership. And I would add a third category, equity in the sense of reciprocity, mm -hmm. which is what I think is really the central insight of Mauricio's work, which is there is this drive within all human beings. We, uh, we are not just homo economicus. We are not just people who are out to maximize benefit for ourselves but we are homo reciprocon. You know, we are beings that are built, built for reciprocity. Um, and, and therefore uh, the market actually uh, is just a manifestation of that initial instinct of people to exchange with one another. Um, uh, and, and so I think there's really, um, that, that's really the central insight, I think, that has drawn me to Mauricio's work is that it starts there. It starts with the idea that uh, low-income people are people and all people have this capacity to um, seek one another out and to exchange uh, in ways that create mutual benefit and that that really lift people up, that that's as much a part of us um, as the um, uh, advantage maximizing side of us. You know, um, it, we are, we're divided beings in many ways. And that's one of the ways that we're divided um, is that we share, uh, we share both a desire to have more and to expand and to grow and to build up what we have. Uh, but we also have an innate desire to share, um, uh, and uh, that—that's what's really exciting to me about um, about Mauricio's work um, is th this emphasis on um, paying it forward, of sharing knowledge. Uh, Mauricio just took his mute off, so I think he's got something he really needs to say. So I'm going <laughs> to let him jump in right now. Well, actually, I really like listening to other people, and and I just kind of want to appreciate. I want to appreciate where all of you are landing. Um, we've been working a little bit with Bridge Span, who they spent half a million dollars trying to understand what the hell I've been doing for the last 20 years. So <laughs> they had a whole team, including writers, trying to figure out, you know, and they did come up with an article, but um, they researched it and they broke down, because uh, I'm not, you know, I was a bad engineer. I, I couldn't break it down structurally. They, they basically broke down the work that I'd been doing that for at that point for 19 years into three elements, three ingredients. One is that it was a mixture of these three. One is self-determination and the issue of, of basically helping yourself. You know, that self-determination was really one of the elements that seemed present in all of the mutuality and the community and the, the different examples that I kept going through that I grew up in. The second piece, which is not separate, was what you guys are talking about, mutuality, that reciprocity, but more than reciprocity, which tends to be more transactional. Mutuality is much more of personal benefit. And that piece, I think that 
they felt like really was very important. In other words, especially for scale, you could deal with, you know, the self-determination, whatever, the individual capitalist that makes a lot of money and maybe they're fine. But the issue in terms of scale, because they, they realized I was much more interested, well, how do we reach that, what you're talking about, four to six billion people that really are being left out of all this? How do you reach them? And that mutuality was really important. The third piece was financial. I mean, we classified people as poor, basically on their income. And obviously it makes a difference. You know, you're surviving. My mother sometimes didn't have enough money to feed her. You know, she always got food for us, but sometimes didn't have enough for herself. So, you know, financial piece. Now, what's interesting about the anti-poverty movement or the war on poverty, or whatever, um, is there is a focus certain on individuals. We'll do training of an individual. We'll focus on youth. We'll focus on that the focus on individuals and and we're very used to in a capitalist society of you know that entrepreneur the single entrepreneur they also focus on financial although for low income it's been micro loans and whatever but those two have been focused on and so the principal at bridgespan asked the team that he's spending all this money on so so what's different about what this alternative is that Mauricio has been presenting and they said it's the mutuality that our society does not look at that and that that is actually how things scale. So it's true. When I'm talking about the Liberia families now being the primary consultants to the Ugandan families, that before it was just that the Liberian for families would be able to talk with each other. What's really fascinating now, especially with COVID, with Zoom and, and whatever, technology allows families across countries and across continents to share information. And they're doing it. And we can be facilitators of that sharing. So the mutuality piece you know, fits into Adam Smith or whatever, I didn't realize that. But, you know, essentially that is the key and that it isn't separate. You need to allow for self-determination and you need to make sure that the financial pieces work, but, but without mutuality and without knowing that that is sort of a natural instinct. If we do not cultivate that natural instinct, we can, we can try to kill it. What's interesting is that we don't kill it. <laughs> you know, we, we kind of move against it all the time. We have programs for the individual and we make families compete to look more needy than each other in order to get access. You know, we have needs-based type of benefit structure. That's crazy. But it's really the mutuality piece that I really appreciate that you guys caught. Well, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about it is, you, you know, when you look at, uh, at mutuality, uh, co-ops and, and the cooperative movement, um, actually emerged out of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Robert Dale Owen, um, one of the most successful capitalists at the height of the Industrial Revolution, the, the era of the dark satanic mills, uh, was in effect the father of the cooperative movement, uh, mm -hmm. the father of corporate social responsibility. So it yeah. is possible to have within a capitalist system um, a way, an ethic, if you will, that deals with the other side of, of equity, the, the fairness side and the mutuality side, I think that Brent, that Brent added to the conversation. Um, it's, it's, it strikes me that, that one of the things that, that is difficult for us to do is to look through the right end of the telescope when we're thinking about these smaller scale ventures, smaller scale entrepreneurship, these microcosmic ventures. Right. Um, it's, it's to some extent the problem I think we have when we discount the future. We, we don't know how to create the metrics that look at the fundamental mechanics, the elements, the economic Lego blocks that are being built by the Camillas of the, of, of the world and, and right. Mauricio, your mom. When you look at that on, in their own scale, they have all of the elements of larger businesses. They have all of the risks of the larger business. They have all of the potential rewards of the larger, of the larger businesses, but they're in, they're in smaller units. And it's almost as if we need to micro size our financial instruments in order to be able to unleash the potential uh, of right. grassroots entrepreneurship. Uh, I mentioned to, to, to Mauricio the other day, there's a wonderful book for those of you who are interested in this area, although it's outside the U.S. context, is a book uh, ironically published by Princeton University Press called Portfolios of the Poor. Right. And it, it reveals just how incredibly sophisticated poor people are in setting up their own financial mechanisms to deal with risk and calamity. Uh, and it's a, it's a nice context to think about how you might be able to apply some of those same insights in the, in the U.S. context. 
Cornelia, I want to give you a chance to get in here. Um, what are your thoughts and responses to what you've heard so far? Yeah, well, I, I wanted to actually chime in. I think one interesting thing to maybe add to the conversation too is um, if you look at Liberia and you look at the United States, obviously Liberia is a more homogenous society, uh, maybe less stratified, I don't know. Um, and you compare it to, to the US, which is uh, a country of immigrants uh, with, uh, you know, a very stratified social system. And I wonder how mutuality would play in that context. And um, the other piece is uh, financing is one aspect, uh, to John's point, one aspect of this, you know, supporting these really small ventures. But you also have to think about their, the markets, the markets for the products that these um, sustenance entrepreneurs uh, create. And uh, it's much easier, I think, um, and this, is, this has a lot to do with our sort of our his, history of, of uh, sy systemic injustice and racism in this country. But if you look at um, uh, markets, it's much easier for, for uh, elite entrepreneurs to sell into, uh, let's say, disadvantaged markets than it is the other way around. So that's another piece of this. Um, it's not just about financing, it's also access to, to the marketplaces. Yeah. Now, I, I think both points um, kind of to add to it is that um, in if you look at basically six billion people living in and around poverty, uh, strivers or whatever, that um, it's a huge marketplace. And somehow or other, I can tell you that they all want cell phones. They'd love to have a smartphone. <laughs> that they really strive for a lot of what we easily have access to. And however, that somehow or other business has not actually decided to tap that huge market, to invest in it so that it has the ability to buy their smartphone or whatever, which is, to me, it's dumbfounding. It's like if you have a place, you know, places like this, that, that there is demand for this, but really what they don't have is the income. When I could see incomes jump 250% based just on $100 of my investment, these almost one of the first things they're going to buy is a smartphone. I mean, the, you know, there are markets that our corporations just have not decided to try to tap or support or build. We'll send a lot of advertising to each other. You know, but we're only 20% of the world. Right? It's like somehow or other, we haven't figured out that if what we do is all work together, it actually builds the pie and to be much bigger. It's almost like if they get, we won't get. No, that's not the case. You know, yeah, we well. can build a world economy. So somehow or other, we need to change the attitudes, even of our corporate leaders and whatever. You have to invest in this because it will grow your marketplace. Some of the ideas that you know, uh, John has and whatever, somehow or other, I think those can take root because people are really waiting to be able to use their talent and initiative. Well, the, the irony to me is that to some extent, I think um, the capitalist market at the top of the pyramid is sort of a zero sum game. Yeah. The real, the real game lies below the top of the market. Yeah. And McKinsey, McKinsey, about five years ago, uh, Mauricio went directly at this. They, they looked at this potential untapped demand below the, the top, say, billion, billion and a half people in the world. And their phrase, I don't may not get this quite right, but it, it was essentially this is the biggest economic opportunity in the history, in the history of mankind. It's sitting there. It's waiting there. But it can't be approached and it can't be unleashed with the same kind of models and the same kind exactly. of metrics that we use at the top. Uh, exactly. It has to be it has to be thought out, thought about differently. It has to be funded differently. And it has to it has to understand that this is not a top down situation. This is a yeah. this is this is an opportunity to unleash from the bottom up yeah. to, to, to help people do what they want to do yeah. for themselves in their own yeah. communities. So I and that's kind of where I wanted us to go in this conversation, um, thinking about, you know, all of the all of the insights that Mauricio has gleaned um, over the years, including this experiment in um, in West Africa and uh, now in Uganda, which is Central Africa. Uh, but uh, what would it look like? try to do something like 
this project in West Africa in the United States. Um, what would be necessary in order to try this here rather than, you know, because you're talking about the, the top, you know, the, or the bottom of the, the pyramid globally, but what about the bottom of the pyramid here in the United States? How do we, how do we take this idea that Mauricio has been talking about and, tr and move it inside the United States? I just, I'm very intrigued by that idea. And I think I'll give Mauricio the first shot at that. Um, at yeah. That and I want everybody else's comments too. I, I, let me add something. Cause, um, I'm experiencing some of that uh, at about four o'clock today when uh, my kind of independent contractor, uh, Javier, comes to actually take down some of my deck. The fact is in the United States that what we see in Liberia in the United States is part of the informal economy here. And the informal economy is huge. In our poorest neighborhoods that we think aren't contributing anything, there is a ton of entrepreneurship. I guess there used to be a uh, a research firm called uh, Social Compact, and they researched Oakland back in 2000 something or whatever, and they found that the the informal economy in Oakland was something something like 450 million dollars. They were doing the mayor had done it in order to try to attract companies to come. There's actually you know capital here that can be spent on your products if you put whatever. And so that's what they researched. So what is that the, the available capital from these very poor families? Well, there's a whole informal economy. That's the way Chinatown used to be. It had its own little economy and that still kind of goes on. The fact is we have rules that make those economic transfers illegal. You know, well, you don't have workman's comp, you don't do this or that, you know, without a healthcare system to back these, you know, the, the, we don't accept them. And so essentially we have huge portions of our population working informally and they are working because they're showing up at my house later today. Uh, they are working and they are producing basically jobs. He came with two people yesterday. Those people then pay taxes to buy diapers and you know they pay their housing and whatever. So they are contributing and they're having to come up with their own jobs, but they're called illegal. And those contributions really could be, we could change our policies and whatever, the Small Business Administration, you have to be 500 employees. You have no chance of competing the way we're looking at entrepreneurship right now. So that's one of the areas. It's like the whole informal economy is existing in the United States in these neighborhoods. Yeah, Mauricio, I, I'm struck. You know, you talk uh, about the makers and the and the takers. I think there's a whole mid group called the fakers, <laughs> and, 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 and the fakers and, and the fakers a lot of times can be you know folks like the SBA. I mean, if you really if you really thinking about small business and you are ignoring this phenomenon of micro businesses at the grassroots neighborhood level. And you're not figuring out how to create financing mechanisms and risk management instruments for them. Um, yep. How can you call yourself the Small Business Administration? And I'll leave aside all the foreign aid, you know, infrastructure that we're right. talking about. Cornelia, I didn't want to didn't want to overcome. <laughs> Cornelia, you got. Well, I know. I, I think this is a great. This is a great conversation. I mean, I, I think. Um... I, I just want I just want to make a big plug for I guess a lot of the sustenance entrepreneurship that goes on in those communities and really honoring the people that do that type of work because they have an immense amount on their plate. I mean, there was this wonderful uh, book that came out I think recently um, from a prison faculty called Scarcity, uh, a psychology professor who talks about uh, the impact of poverty on the human brain and what it does. Um, uh, the type of room it takes up uh, psychologically. Uh, so for these um, people to in addition to dealing with all those stresses, actually building these types of businesses. They're, they're the unsung heroes, which goes back into the narrative uh, piece. And I think we we should really figure out a way to elevate those stories and celebrate those as part of the entrepreneurial force uh, in, in our communities. You know, Brent, I was, I was struck uh, when I was looking at one of the questions, uh, do you see the role for crowdfunding marketplaces oh, yeah. and websites like GoFundMe and Kickstarter in this new, in this new paradigm of peer-driven change and, and less help? Uh, my, my response to that is absolutely. Um, one of the early crowdfunding mechanisms actually started in my class at Berkeley uh, called Indiegogo. Uh, and I've seen how that phenomenon of democratizing 
uh, both contribution capital, but also investment capital uh, has taken root with organizations like GoFundMe and Kickstarter and Indiegogo and now, you know, a slew of others. Um, I think to some extent, um, Mauricio mentioned Kiva. Kiva has usually been a borrowing kind of mechanism, but you could you could easily morph those kinds of broad appeal, democratized, informal financing mechanisms to be equity investments uh, of the hundred dollars per family that Mauricio experimented with in Liberia. Uh, and it doesn't have to necessarily be thought of as philanthropy either. It's not philanthropy in the grand in the grand scheme of things. It is investment capital. It really is. And, and, you know, I'm really glad you guys brought that up because uh, one of the basic mechanisms we have for the families in Liberia that is now being transferred to Uganda and Colombia and Mexico and the Philippines, where we also have projects, is basically a crowdfunding source uh, platform called the Mutuality Platform. And I'll try to make that link available. But it is, if you think about how, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and everything had their family get them some support or I supported my daughter and whatever. These are very small amounts of, of, of dollars. And that more personal touch of smaller is really useful. So what we've done is we've actually been testing, testing that whole uh, concept in Liberia. And what we found is that the families, when they know there is a potential to get another $20 or get another $100 or whatever, they are willing to give us monthly progress data that we can verify. So just the potential, because they've never had the opportunity to try to grow their ideas, but crowdfunding is much easier to do at that. What we are calling it is actually being called stage one seed capital. Phase two is stage two seed capital, which is at the next level. We have seven women trying to start a bread making business in Buchanan. Okay, so that's a larger set of investments, but crowdfunding can actually produce a ton of that, what we need to do this. And when we've started testing it in Liberia, it's like the reaction has been on both sides has been really, really positive. <laughs> maybe maybe we need we need more investment capital for the bakers and the rakers uh, yeah. of the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, 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 what it reminds me of is this thing I tried to do when I was in government at the Department of Labor and we were, I was running the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, which was really in my mind about how do we get down to the smallest organizations and make them part of, you know, give them access to the res all the resources the government throws around. Um, and what we did was we created this uh, micro-grant program. Uh, it was $25,000 for very small social social and human services organizations doing employment work all right and it was very flexible in terms of you know you come in with your idea and tell us how you would you know how you would help people in your community get find jobs or get training or um uh whatever they needed uh and um the resistance to that project was enormous for such a tiny tiny amount of money that we were talking about and the, but the, but it wasn't a nefarious resistance. It was actually that, you know, it requires the same amount of resources for the government to monitor a $25,000 grant as it does to monitor a $250 million grant. Um, and it's just, there is a, uh, there's a, a, an organizational bureaucratic mismatch between small, small organizations and, and government. Um, and that, you know, we were trying to bridge that uh, where we ultimately went just because the administrative burden was so high was to an intermediary concept where we would leverage the institutional resources of larger nonprofits to try to work with and coordinate services with smaller ones. But I, this idea is actually much more attractive, which is a funding source that is not so bound up in uh, a lot of fraud prevention rules, um, which is what it amounts to, that, is, that assumes rather than, you know, that we're going to, uh, that assumes that there is a certain amount of risk and that that, that risk is worth taking um, uh, when you're talking about small entrepreneurs. So I'm not sure government is actually the right place to look for this. I mean, we, we, I think we need to 
you know, be looking around at the other people out there who fund entrepreneurs um, and make those kinds of investments and can do so on a little more flexible basis. Um, I think that was the only question we had from outside. Um, I, one question I wanted, and this is really in Cornelia's um, uh, area, you know, it's a it's kind of a circle that I'm trying to square or square I'm trying to circle out of this conversation, which is Mauricio is really in the the internal resources of local entrepreneurs, local communities, helping them figure helping them turn to one another rather than looking outside um, for assistance. The Keller Center really looks like a, a really substantial technical assistance operation, you know, where you are bringing expertise to students to help them realize their vision. How does that fit with um, what Mauricio has been talking about? Or does it fit with what Mauricio has been talking about? Does that constitute helping in a way that we don't want? Or, or is this the kind of helping that we do want? And Mauricio, you can talk about this as well. But I'm really curious as to, like, is there a role for expertise um, in helping businesses get stronger without interfering with um, their their innate capacity? So I'm gonna I want Cornelia if you could respond to that first, and then I'll turn it over to Mauricio to respond. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw up something I think is relatively stark, and I might not it might not be entirely appropriate because I can probably get, shed more light on what I think the experience is like for the students versus what I think it, the experience is like for some of the entrepreneurs that Mauricio has been describing. But um, on the university side, the entrepreneurs receive a lot of support. Uh, it starts with sort of helping them become self aware of their motivations. All right. First, first thing, um, because at the end of the day, if they're not intrinsically motivated, if there's not, if they're not clear about what it is that's motivating them, uh, they're they're not going to be pursuing this path um, for a long time. So it starts a lot with that type of support. Uh, then there's all the the funding, there's the mentorship, um, there's the room to fail, you know, the allowance for failure. Uh, that's all there. Uh, the education piece, of course, uh, and, and and so forth. I think on the on the other side, um, there's not a lot of, of of any of those things, right? right. Um, and so, which pieces would be most useful? I don't know. I would I would think you know I, I was very intrigued actually, Mauricio, when you said um, you talked about power dynamics uh, and you talked about yes. how giving. Um, the folks in Liberia, I think $10 for being filling out surveys and, and that that shifted sort of um, a yeah. sense of, of power dynamics. I was curious how that impacted sort of uh, the sense of confidence and autonomy and and all of that and what what that means as an engine even for for entrepreneurs. Um, so be curious, curious to you know dig a little bit uh, into that and what you've learned what you've learned there. And maybe just a final thought. Um, we do have students, again, that are working on, on societal issues. So there's a lot of focus or hope that we can bring in community to do sort of co-design solutions. I mean, there's a real danger. You've got these students that are in their ivory towers that are really far removed. Um, so there's a lot of expertise that even though we, we shower a lot of um, resources on these students, there's a, a lack of actual knowledge um, deep understanding of issues out in the world that I think there could be uh, a back and forth on um, potentially. So, you know, Cornelia and the way, I, I must admit, you know, I, I that was the first time I ever taught at Princeton or had anything to do with Princeton. And um, I was really impressed uh, and I don't impress very easily, but um, Besides the privilege I felt coming through UC Berkeley, and I did, I felt a lot of privilege. The type of support that Princeton focuses on its students is like, well, shit, I wish my mother, sorry, yeah, my mm -hmm. mother, Camilla, had <laughs> we'll, we'll bleep that out of the recording. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what was interesting about what she said is that they start with becoming first self aware. Now, it is very different. I was talking to Jelani, you know, Jelani and whatever. So, 
he's you know he's coming you know they were probably i think pell eligible or whatever and what was really interesting, he basically said before going to princeton he was essentially saying i wasn't aware mm -hmm. of what would be the possibilities mm -hmm. but once i get there then i start seeing other people and whatever is happening you're in an environment that is very empowering and very quickly he then became, a, oh, I'm going to take advantage of all of these things. <laughs> He's like, it's all <laughs> over the place, right? So the issue of self-awareness then for if you're coming in a low-income community, first of all, is that you've been told so many times that you're a taker from society, mm -hmm. that you don't have the capacity, that we can't trust you with money, we can't trust you with ideas, that so we're gonna come and save you and we're really good people, and, and they are. I mean, they, these are my colleagues over 20 years of doing services. So the, they've been overlaid with this, this consciousness of somehow they don't have the capacity. So when you mentioned what, what is the first thing we do is we're over there, you know, we actually tell them, these are the stereotypes that people have of you, you know? Mm -hmm. So for my mother, it was like, you're considered, and she would say, they think we're lazy and we're dirty, you know? And she said, and so therefore, when we move out of place, it has to be spotless. So people are dealing with that stereotype so often every day, not even just from our good guys. This is, you know, because they hear it on TV all the time, their kids are doing it that before you start doing programs and you know all of that we're talking about what quote we could do, we have to deal with the self-awareness that these families are the only experts of their own lives and communities. That is the dynamic that needs to change. And so we tell them, until you give us the stories of your capacity and your capability, then we can't change that narrative because it's not going to come at you. So you guys have to help us. So okay. that first step is the most important. But Mauricio, I want to I want to push you a little bit on this, um, mm -hmm. which is if you've if you've got uh, all of you've got families or uh, individuals in a in a low income community that you know that are really showing this entrepreneurial drive uh, that have great ideas that um, could really make a go of it. Um, and you've got the strict rule of no helping. What role is there for something like the Keller Center, not exactly the Keller Center, but, right. but an organization like that, that does have expertise that could maybe put this on steroids, you know, put really inject some knowledge and some capacity that's not there. How do you, what do you think about that? So I think I tried to mention that, you know, the way we engage a community is in stages, right? And in phases. So phase one is to put them on a peer level as the only experts. That's why we'll fire staff if you. So phase one for us is to watch when the families know it's really about them, that they are the experts. And we have mechanism low we'll pay you as a consultant, you know, we'll, actually look at your data, we'll change our data to capture what you want, we'll feed you back the data, whatever, and they'll see how we use the data. So that first phase is sort of what, you know, uh, Cornelia was, was basically saying is that you have to deal with that self-awareness first. Right. Okay. okay. After that, once they know that our staff is no smarter than them, they, our staff just has access to a different set of resources, then they interact. So phase two is really the interactive piece. Once the families, you know, they, our families start getting together and started solving community problems. In Colombia, their kids were sliding down the hillsides when it rained and whatever, because there's no steps and no roads and whatever. So the families got together and built the staircase, right? They did that themselves. The parents did that. That's kind of the wherewithal that we're doing. So the, the issue is that the families actually will take initiative to solve problems. But if we're coming in with solutions already, they will try to adjust because we have more money, we have more power. Right. So you first got to get through that first phase. Right, right, very good. Okay, we are over time. Uh, okay. I, wanna th I wanna thank you all, a uh, really terrific discussion. I commend the paper, um, uh, Mauricio's paper, for those who are interested in reading more about this. His book is excellent. Keller Center has an amazing website to go look at in terms of what they're doing. Um, I really, uh, I hope that some of our audience who, uh, you know, have a passion for this idea of um, building on the assets that are already there, and those assets are mainly people, 
with ideas will um, pay attention to this work. Um, it has broad application internationally and, and locally, I think, and, and inside the United States, I should say. So again, many, many thanks to all of you so generous with your time uh, this afternoon. And we look forward to watching you, Mauricio, uh, uh, as you continue to do this amazing work um, at, here, uh, at home and abroad. Well, I'm having lunch with John, so he can figure it out. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I really appreciate this, and Cornelia, I really appreciate your help. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brent. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.